All right, good evening, Hampstead. Uh, welcome to the regular meeting, Tuesday, September 12, 2023, at approximately 7.05 p.m. Um, go ahead and call the meeting to order, and Melissa, can you do the roll call, please? Sure. Jason Giard? Here. Aaron Pellegrini? Here. David Smith? Here. Dr. Carl Hubner? Here. Andy Cabarrus? Here. And Pinkerton Student Liaison, Shannon Cafell? Here. Thank you. And also seated at the board table is Superintendent of Schools, Bob Thompson, and CFO, Jeff Dowd. Right. Thank you, Melissa. You're welcome. All right. If I can ask everybody to stand for the pledge. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Uh, board members, in your packets, there is one set of meeting minutes from the August 22nd regular meeting. Um, looking for you to review and seeking a motion for approval. I will go ahead and make a motion to accept the meeting minutes, regular meeting minutes from August 22nd. All right, motion from Aaron, looking for a second? Second. All right, any discussion on these? All right, I'll approve. I'll abstain from my vote as I was absent. And then I'm safe. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, and Melissa, I understand we have one public comment. That's correct, Chairman. All right. If you want to come on up. And then uh, just to remind, we, we do have uh, three minutes for public comments per person. So. Right. Uh, so Michael Shaw, 19 Glorious Way. I have a student in both middle school and central school here. Um, the only reason I came down today to voice my concern, I was telling Melissa. Yes. Uh, that I was trying to contact you through the website, through the forms. I have no idea if you've been receiving them or not. Um, with all the media coverage with rising cases of COVID and mask mandates popping up across the country, even some colleges, some hospitals in New York, um, it had me worried about this possibly coming back to Hampstead. Uh, before, when the choice was taken away from parents, on whether or not to put their kids in a mask. It was, it was awful for my kids. Two years ago, this board made a great choice, in my opinion, to give the choice back to the parents. I'm just hoping that if it does come up again, I strongly urge this council, this school board to not, to not take it away from the parents. That's pretty much it. All right, thanks, Mr. Trump. Uh, to answer you, though, I will say I did not receive any communication, so if you want, um, right. I, I can get Jeremy. my email. She gave me your, your okay. email, yep, so. Thank you. Thank you. That out. Melissa, and that's all for public comments, correct? That's correct. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, we're going to now move on to school highlights, uh, starting with uh, Central School Principal Dr. Cheney. Good evening, everybody. I'm pleased to um, tell you a little bit about our opening of school this year. So far, it has been very positive. It is lovely to have students back in the building. During the summer, we're very busy. We have a lot going on, but it's, it's just a different feel when there are kids back in the building, learning the routines and engaging in all of the things that we're doing. Right now, we have 469 students at the Central School. I know the last time I gave you a board update, there was some question around grade two. Our number at grade two is currently at 99 students, and we have between 21 and, uh, 20 and 21 students per classroom. So we're still below that policy threshold that we discussed at the last board meeting. 
Um, I'm pleased to let you know that our new main entry with students and staff in the building is working. Um, Non-school adults or folks who don't have any permanent pertinent business in the school are restricted from our main stairwell and the main parts of our building. There's a small vestibule where folks can wait as they dismiss their children or as they drop things off. And this is helping us to keep all of our students and staff safe. This week we celebrated the 21st Read with a Hero celebration. Um, and this is something that has occurred every 9-11 since 2002. This year we had readers meet with our students um, from Hampstead, Merrimack, Hampton, and Bedford. So I wanna make sure I say thank you to Firefighter Hood, Officer Wentworth, Officer Fair, Officer Whitehead, Captain Chris Stain, Firefighter Kat Warnock, Officer Winter, Officer Wallen, Retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Stedman, Commander Van Horn with the Navy, and Detective Randall, as well as Veteran Shanahan and Veteran Byrne, who all donated their time and energy to come and read to our students this year. We're grateful that we have such wonderful first responder partners who continue to come back year after year. Um, there's actually an article in today's Eagle Tribune, and Kat Warnock, who was one of our readers this year, was in the first class of students as a preschooler at Central School who heard from readers in 2002. Um, and then tonight we also welcomed a small group of folks who are interested in walking through the Central School to see summer projects. And if anybody else is interested in a tour of HCS but not able to make it tonight, please feel free to reach out and I'd be happy to accommodate. Are there any questions I can answer for you tonight? Thank you. Good evening. Um, the middle school is also off and running and we also enjoy having our students in the building. We've had um, a good start. We started our very first day with a whole school assembly, which is always a really nice way to start, setting the tone, trying to be really positive. The kids are happy to be back. Teachers are, and staff are happy to have them back. Um, and we've gotten into our middle school schedule slowly. The first couple of days are different schedules just to get kids used to the new routines each grade level has different and new routines and the kids have done a really good job. I have to commend everyone for making it through the heat last week. Staff, students, everybody was troopers. Um, and we also are really excited that we've already had some student-led things happening here. So really off the bat working on um, students just being empowered to, to in a leadership role. And we had a 9-11 Memorial in the morning on Monday, um, led by five students. I would like to commend Kendall LaBelle, Emmalyn Luther, Gus Anderson, Keelan Karpinski, and Katie Fortin, who participated in that ceremony, did a fantastic job, and thanks to Mrs. Wolf and Mrs. Mayu for helping them with that. So we're, we're off and running, um, mostly a really positive start. We have had uh, some changes, you know, when you're in year one of being a new principal, you take the time to observe and see what's going on, and and um, see how things work. And then in year two, we might make a few changes based on what happened, things that were observed last year. So one of those changes was um, the lack of using lockers. And so this year we told students that we're gonna use lockers and um, we've rocked some people's worlds for sure. It was a big change. And there are some reasons behind it and we, we've been having lots of conversations. I've been having conversations with parents, with students about the need for that change. and primarily a safety concern. We had a lot of backpacks in classrooms, blocking pathways and making it hard to navigate. And if there were a true emergency and we had to evacuate quickly, that would be an issue. Um, as well as middle schoolers traditionally struggle with executive functioning skills. This is kind of the years that we're really helping them work on those skills, work on organization, and using lockers is one way to do that, kind of thinking about what do I need for my next class or my next two classes? Which, which books do I need? Which other um, supplies do I need to go to class with and, and helping them and teachers have been helping with the schedule for using lockers and just helping them with that as well as kids were carrying around some really really heavy backpacks so we made that change we're hearing that people are concerned that the change has been hard we're trying to kind of ride it out for a little bit of time to see if people settle in and and get into a routine that works but also welcoming student input and student voice 
students have been voicing opinions and we've been saying, let's have a discussion about it, let's talk about it. So we're gonna continue to do that and see where we go from there. So that's, that's kind of been our little bit of a bump in the road at the beginning, but it's you know really created some opportunities for students to express kind of things that aren't working for them. So that's been, that's been good. Questions? It's certainly been something that's been talked about, um, and so yes, I would say we can we can definitely consider options like that if there's a, a middle of the ground with something that fits under a desk. The concern I have a little bit with the drawstrings is those some of them are not very sturdy, and they're all carrying Chromebooks. I think that 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 was a little bit pre one to one device and carrying Chromebooks around. So if students start putting Chromebooks and even the metal water bottles in, and they break then that could be a problem too. So there, I mean, there are pros and cons to it, but I, I certainly, we are open to options and we are open to listening and trying to come to a, a you know, a place where everybody feels comfortable. So it's certainly on the table. Yes, for sure. Yep. Yep. Anyone else? I just know that in my experience at the school that I was at, when we had an impromptu accidental fire drill with bags in the cafeteria, it was a total mess and it was really hard to, it, it did not feel safe at all and we actually made the change that bags had to stay in classrooms during lunch and to adjust how we did things. So it is. For me, it is a safety concern, and that's always the first thing, and then you work around everything else. So it, it, it's always at your discretion, but it makes sense to me, so. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Okay. All right, next up is uh, Shannon Caffell, a student rep from Pinkerton. Hey, Shannon. Hi. Cool. Okay, um, I'm very happy to be back again this year. This was a lot of fun last year. And so this summer went by very fast, at least for me, but you know, Pinkerton never stops. There's always something going on. And so we welcomed um, Mr. Perez as our new associate head of students. Um, and I've had a few chances to speak with him and he's all in, he's so ready. And that was really great to hear. We had orientation days, August 30th and 31st. Students were able to visit all their classes and um, there was a, Here's our year assembly. So we got to see what all the fun events we're gonna have. And that actually starts this weekend, <laughs> Saturday, September 16th with our annual senior corn roast. I had no idea what that actually meant before, but it's just as it sounds. <laughs> um, and then we head right into Spirit Week, the 18th, all the way through the 22nd. That Friday is our pep rally in um, Mac Plaque. Sporting events happen all throughout the week, um, and we hope to keep the plaque at Pinkerton again this year. Saturday the 23rd is our homecoming dance, or our Mac plaque dance, um, and the Pinkerton Hall of Fame ceremony is September 21st. It's an event where alumni are nominated and inducted and all that sort of stuff. Early release is September 27th, and later that night is our open house. Parents can come in, look around the school, see children's classrooms, meet all their teachers, Freshman reception is September 28th, and it's a great event for only freshmen where they get to connect outside the classroom and make those important connections that they get to have all four years. Dr. Powers has started a new series. You know, he's always up to something. Now he's going into classrooms, jumping around campus, jumping in with students. And this past week, he was in the band room trying to conduct a band. <laughs> it was interesting. I think he did a great job. It's so weird to see the new social studies wing half taken down, but 
I have a perfect view from one of my classrooms to see everything that's going on. And it's crazy to think that students will start learning there in a little over a year. And once the base foundation is finished, they will tear the rest of that wing down and start going up. And so, that's, it's just crazy. <laughs> I'm so sad I won't be able to be in the building, but my brother will be. And I'm super excited for this year. I think it's gonna be a good year. Nice. Well, welcome back. Um, questions for Shannon, anyone? Any uh, words of wisdom for any parents out there with freshmen that just started at Pinkerton? It's a big change, but they will get used to it. I know the schedules are crazy, but once you get into that routine, everything just kind of falls into place and it makes sense. All right. It was more for me, so just... <laughs> <laughs> no. All right. no, thank you. Yep. All right. Um, so we're going to move on to current business. Uh, first one is for Dr. Cheney uh, with a uh, donation acceptance request. Um, I'd like to ask the board tonight to consider accepting a donation of $2,000 from the Hampstead Mothers Club. This donation will support filling our book vending machine at the Hampstead Central School. Um, last year, you might remember, we purchased the book vending machine with uh, grant monies, and it was a huge success. This year, we're going to have a monthly theme, and kids will earn books, and this donation will support us in that endeavor. Great. Uh, looking for a motion to accept the gift of two thousand dollars from the Hampstead Mothers Club. Mm -hmm. right. And a second from Mr. Jard. Any questions? Discussion? I'd just say thank you to the um, Mothers Club, and also I know the kids last year enjoyed uh, receiving books for different activities. So uh, it's definitely a fun addition to the Central School. So um, I guess all approved. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next up, back up to the podium, Mrs. Milbury on the seventh grade field trip. So I'm excited to talk about the seventh grade nature's classroom field trip. I know I mentioned it in the spring, but I'm here to officially ask the board for permission to do this overnight trip for our seventh graders. Um, I think it's something that's been done in the past years ago. It's an overnight experience. Um, they will be going this year to Old Orchard Beach is where this particular nature's classroom site is where there's two nights and two days of just packed of outdoor experiential science-based activities that are just really awesome and really fit into the curriculum of the seventh grade science really well so with your approval we would like to move forward with that trip All right. um, I guess I'll I'll make the motion to approve, look for a second, I definitely have some questions, but so I'll make the motion to approve the request for the two, two days, two nights uh, for the seventh grade trip. I'll second that. All right. um, question about the cost for the students is $300 per student. Yes. Um, what if any parents cannot afford that right now? Are we looking at ways to offset that cost? Great question. Um, we're not looking at any fundraising or anything, but if there are people who are struggling to be able to afford that, they should definitely reach out and we will work with them to find um, support for the funding. And I'm right. confident that we will be able to. They reach out to you yourself yes. or? They could reach out to myself or they could reach out to um, Bob Mayu or Julie Barbic, our social worker, whoever they're comfortable reaching out to. But I'm happy to have those conversations confidentially and work with them to make sure we want all students who want to go to be able to go for sure. Okay. I have the same okay. Is this open and inclusive for all of our seventh grade students yes the hope would be that everybody goes some people you know we know that with overnight trips not it's not everybody wants to do that but yes it, everybody that is able and wants to go you know everybody that wants to go is able to go for sure okay thank you that was gonna be my next question since old orchard is i'm gonna say kind of close if there were any students that didn't want to do overnight but want to go for the day and there was some way for their parents or someone to get them there to and from it, would that it, they be open for that or you is going to be solely it has to be overnight that's a great question and and not one that i have explored but i'm happy to look into it i can't okay. imagine why that would be a barrier to be able to enjoy the, the day portion of it I, yep. I would hope not but okay. um i certainly would be willing to look into that and people right. should definitely ask that question we'll send out um, a survey to to parents um very soon asking if they are 
wanting to go so we can get a head count and start to um, plan further and get out more information to families once we know how many are attending. So definitely anybody that has questions, concerns, um, should reach out to myself okay. or Lori Lynn Griffin, who's really kind of the lead as a science teacher. Right. And that's what I was going to ask next. Can you give us a kind of an overview of some of the things that they'd be learning that day? Any, um, any of the you know, bigger topics? And I did not bring that in front of me, but I can tell you that um, uh, some of it is just about oceans and the coast and uh, the environment around oceans, tides, things like that. One of the things that Nature's Classroom always does, and, and I believe this site will do that as well, um, is you know they learn about food waste. And so they, I don't want to give anything away because I'm hoping kids aren't watching, but anyway, I won't give it all away, but the kids learn based on things, you know, what they don't eat, they learn about food waste and how to how to cut down on food waste, things like that, and how that all of that waste impacts our environment, and it's it's just all really hands-on, um, experiential stuff. It's it's really great, but the the Old Orchard location does lean itself to it being the coastal, and yeah. the focus will be on the coastline and, and all that goes with that. Yeah, I remember when I was a kid, just a few years ago, not many, but you know, um, also did Nature's Classroom. It was one of my best experiences, so I'm glad that's still going on yeah. and that we uh, give children that opportunity. So, would it be Jason, possible? A couple, years ago. a couple weeks ago? <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, would it be possible for maybe the first meeting in October to have a rough draft or something of an agenda so that we have it in our packets and something that maybe we can post so the parents have a copy as well? For what, what's happening at Nature's Classroom? Yes. Absolutely. Awesome. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Uh, all approved? Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's see. Mr. Thompson for the 2023-2024 uh, year strategy plan. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, I am delighted tonight uh, to present the Hampstead School District uh, Strategic Plan Deliverables uh, for the 23-24 school year. Uh, this is the second year of our strategic plan. It's a three-year plan. And um, when we wrote this plan, um, we really had an inclusive process. We had stakeholders uh, from our teachers, support staff, parents, school board members, administrators. We surveyed the community, uh, we met with uh, various groups, um, collected input, and developed what I believe is a very thoughtful uh, and robust plan. One of the features of the plan um, that I think is a highlight is the concept of this annual deliverable. So oftentimes, organizations will write strategic plans, they pat each other on the back, they put it on a shelf, it collects dust, and then a few years down the road, they dust it off and they write a new one. The, the format of this strategic plan, that's not how we operate, right? So we develop a series of deliverables every year. This is our accountability measure to the school board, and it's our accountability to the community. It is a deep commitment to students in their learning, and it is a deep commitment to continuous improvement. Our team will never get to a point where we'll ever say we are good enough. We will always say, how can we be just a little bit better? And the presentation that you're gonna hear tonight is an articulation of our district's values, our mission, and our priorities as defined in the strategic plan document. So there are a total of five priorities. Each of the buildings has approximately three action items under those priorities. So I just want you to think about that uh, for a minute. In total, we have, I think there's actually a total of 31 action items that we are committed to work on 
that helps us in our mission. And I'll tell you right now, we may not achieve all of them, right? Um, last year, there were things that we said to the board that we would do that we just didn't get done. Sometimes priorities change, sometimes uh, new work presents itself. So you'll see in this year's plan, there's a continuation of some of the things we said we would do that we didn't get around to do. And uh, assuredly in June, when we report out to the board, there'll be things that we actually uh, were able to achieve that we didn't talk about in September. And there'll be things, uh, action items that we will, will work on next year. It's a continuous process. Uh, and just, I am not gonna steal the thunder of the people standing behind me who are gonna go into a little bit more detail, uh, but it's this group of people with input uh, from the board, uh, input from staff, uh, in the form of feedback surveys, um, and just priority work that has driven the creation of these deliverables. You know, we are going to look to uh, improve and continue uh, the groundbreaking work that we've done with Universal Design for Learning. We're gonna continue personalization of learning for students. We're gonna continue to evaluate uh, the programs that we have in place for their effectiveness. Uh, we are gonna work on supporting uh, the well-being of our staff and our students. We're gonna look for opportunities uh, to improve communication. And this year that focus is on uh, providing more opportunities to engage with our community, more opportunities for volunteers. And uh, lastly, you know, we're going to look to uh, create more experiential learning opportunities. We just heard Mrs. Milbury talk about that. Uh, th that is, in essence, uh, what you'll hear and see as we talk about our values, we look at the priorities, and we look at this year's deliverables. Uh, so with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to our Director of Student Services, Jessica Parsons, who's going to talk about our school district values. Good evening, everyone. Um, so as you can see, um, our core values are listed over there. Um, but I think what's important to highlight is how we embedded those core values into the development of our deliverables. These values are not only shaping the culture of our district, but they also have a profound effect on the educational experience and outcomes for our, our students, our educators, and our community. So if, if these are our core values, we need to walk the talk. I mean, we need to talk the talk, walk the walk, but we also need to make sure that we're embedding these core values or using the lens of these core values as we're um, uh, developing our deliverables. Um, and so here is why each of these values are important in our um, decision-making process. So positive communication, why it matters. It matters because it fosters a healthy and supportive environment where stakeholders feel valued, heard, and respected, and it promotes trust and open dialogue. Honoring the child places students at the center of our educational process and the center of our educational decisions. And it acknowledges their unique needs, backgrounds, and perspectives. Um, relationship and team building build strong and effective teams, which is critical and crucial for achieving common goals and fostering a sense of belonging within the district. Acting with integrity is the foundation of trust and ethical behavior. It ensures that the decisions and actions we make are guided by honesty, fairness, and ethics. Culture of collaboration encourages collective problem solving and innovation, and it values diverse perspectives and expertise. And so when we go through our priorities and when we go through our deliverables, you'll recognize that a lot of these values are embedded in the work that we're doing. And incorporating these um, values into our deliverables shows our commitment to providing a high quality education that prioritizes the well-being and success of our students. And it helps to build a, a positive and inclusive school culture that sets the stage for continued growth and excellence for our students. So I encourage you, while you're hearing this, to think about what values they align with. Thank you. I'm here to talk about the five strategic plan priorities. So this slide is not new, and these priorities are not new, but when we start, brainstorming and thinking about all of the things we want to accomplish this year, these are the five kind of criteria that really help us place and organize and prioritize the work. Um, so our first priority is around empowering students. This is really at the heart of our belief system that we want students who are expert learners, both in terms of skills and mastery of standards, but also kiddos who have confidence 
and ownness on their learning. Um, our second priority is for examining programs and practices, both for you know, evidence-based and innovation, but also evidence-based approaches and innovative approaches to education, but also for you know, financial responsibilities. We want to be clear on what we're purchasing and if it's useful. Um, the third priority is taking care of each other, taking care of our students and really taking good care of our staff. That goes towards recruitment events. That also goes for, towards retention um, of staff, which is increasingly hard to do in a public school. Our fourth priority is around communication and community involvement. You'll see several uh, new initiatives with that. And then our fifth priority is these amazing dynamic learning environments. So really thinking outside the box, making community partners, physically bringing students outside, but also bringing experts in, bringing internal field trips in, and just you know making sure that kids have experiences outside of the walls of the classroom. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the first priority um, at the Hampstead Central School. So as Mrs. Tomaselli noted, our, the first priority is to empower students to become expert learners who have the confidence to advocate for themselves and take responsibility for their learning. We're looking to do that by expanding on a process we put into place last year called instructional rounds. Instructional rounds are an opportunity for teachers to view each other in practice. And last year, each of our teachers had an opportunity to participate in, this in that once. Um, we're looking to expand that to three times. Not every staff member will participate in all three, but it's my hope and goal that everyone will participate in at least two of the three rounds. Our focus this year will be on that idea of personalized learning and making sure every student is getting what they need. We are also looking to foster a sense of belonging and community through the school-wide implementation of classroom morning meetings. Last year when we studied our schedule and met as a scheduling team, one thing that was very important for us to put in was a sacred 20 minutes every day for a morning meeting opportunity for teachers to meet with their students when they came in, to help them check in, get to know each other, and we're hoping to have 100% classroom implementation in grades preschool through four by the end of the year. And finally, around priority one, we're going to develop a protocol and resources to support the developmentally appropriate student goal setting. This is work that our UDL team is invested and excited about, and we'll be able to share some of those resources by this spring. Now for Mrs. Milbury. Okay, so for, for priority one at the middle school, um, the first deliverable we are, is develop written norms and expectations and enhance student learning through improved instruction. We're working with a um, consultant who's come and worked with us twice now, who is focusing on our PLC work, which is professional learning communities, and working within our teams. They've been doing some work on norms, and they're gonna continue to do work on instructional practices and assessment practices. We will also be working on creating consistent school-wide grading practices and beginning to align assessments to standards. So grading practices in the middle school kind of vary from teacher to teacher, and it's important to us that we have some consistent practices so it's easy for parents at home to understand, it's easy for students to understand, and so that we're all working towards the same goal, and also aligning assessments to match with that work. So this work really all ties in together nicely. And lastly, we are working to empower students to take ownership of their learning through goal setting, reflection, and fostering a growth mindset. We started this work last year with some student reflection. Our UDL committee worked on um, a, a process for students to be able to reflect on their learning, and we want to move forward with that. We plan to use advisory time to do some real goal setting with students. We talked at meetings today about having extended advisory time where we could sit down and advisors with their students could really talk about what is goal setting, why do we goal set, and what is a goal that you would like to set so that they are goal setting once per quarter. Leave I stay up for number two. Perfect. Uh, examine current programs and practice for relevance and effectiveness. The first one is ensure students have access to high quality and relevant 
learning by reviewing and revising curriculum in the areas of math, science, and ventures, grades preschool through grade eight. This is a continuation of work that we did last year where, and over the next few years, where we're gonna be examining all of our programming just to ensure that it's, the curriculum is relevant to what we're working on with our students and making sure that, you know, for some, some of it is needing to purchase new curriculum or, or looking at kind of our licenses expiring. So we're just, we have a commitment to be continuing to look at our programming to make sure that we're doing what's best for kids through that programming. I'm gonna invite Nicole up to talk about the next one. Oh, sorry, Mr. Schmidt. Some of these you'll notice are repeats between HMS and HCS because they're district initiatives, so that's a little bit of the um, you know, traffic jam. Our next one you'll notice is develop a new comprehensive educator evaluation model that supports teaching and learning by providing timely feedback. So we do have an educator, educator evaluation model in place you know, this year, last year, um, but we would like to revise it and make it a little bit more streamlined, make the walkthroughs come faster and the feed more most importantly the feedback and the coaching faster to teachers um, we did start this work last year got a little bit sidetracked by some of the other initiatives and did not complete it in the meantime there are some revised professional standards out by the DOE so we'll be taking those into consideration and we have a committee already formed so that work will be you know we're a little bit ambitious with the January timeline but that needs to happen soon So the last one for this priority for the middle school is identify and align existing academic resources to support and refine the implementation of MTSS. We started some great work with MTSS last year, kind of dipped our toes in it a little bit, and this year are really moving forward with it, both MTSS A for academics and MTSS B for behavior, um, through a lot of work looking at data, meeting in teams, um, spending time within our teams to really look at our programming and look at what students need and continue with that work so that all students are getting what they need and that we're regularly looking at our data to show where kids need the support. Next is the Central School. All right, thank you, Mrs. Milberry. Um, at the Central School for priority number two, uh, just like the um, middle school, we'll be looking at uh, ensuring that students have access to high quality and uh, relevant learning, reviewing curriculum uh, as part of our curriculum review cycle uh, and aligning our learning activities uh, with the standards that are established uh, for preschool through grade four. We also will be identifying and aligning existing academic resources to support and refine the implementation of MTSS, which is multi-tiered systems of support for our students to help support uh, student learning at all different levels. Uh, and to give students the support that they need to be successful. Um, the other piece that we also are working on in priority number two is we're developing a new comprehensive education, educator evaluation model uh, that supports our teachers and the learning and providing timely feedback. And I actually will invite uh, Mrs. Tomaselli back up to the podium to speak a little bit more about that. This is kind of funny. It's the same educator evaluation model at Central School as it is at the middle school. We do, I want to take this opportunity to say though that the staff will have opportunities to pilot and give us feedback throughout this process. Um, so if there are staff members listening that want to volunteer their classrooms when the time comes to test this new model, we'll be happy to um, have those people step forward. Are, are you the one conducting the evaluations or is it? No, our building level admins conduct the primary level and secondary level of evaluations. Um, district level admin will conduct uh, evaluations if there's areas of concern or if there's a district level employee or district wide employee, if that makes sense. Yep. Um, part of that process will all be spelled out though in the plan. So this is the writing of that plan and then every year we sit down and kind of dole out who does what for evaluations. Great. Um, so next up we have Central School. Talking about priority. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Tomaselli. Uh, for priority number three at the Central School, we have foster a positive school culture that honors the emotional well-being of staff and students. Uh, 
in this uh, priority, we're looking to enhance uh, school culture for staff and students through the implementation of restorative circles in all grade levels. And I am happy to say uh, that we are very excited about this work and we've already started the groundwork for s the successful implementation of restorative circles, uh, which is an interactive, collaborative approach to building classroom uh, culture and community uh, where all students are valued and working on building uh, interpersonal skills, which is uh, very, very important. Uh, we also uh, plan to promote the physical and emotional wellness of our staff and uh, by developing a series of wellness activities and developing opportunities for student leadership, including monthly staff, I'm sorry, monthly student um, school-wide uh, morning meetings um, for our students to be able to uh, build, again, that sense of community and foster that positive school culture that we're striving for in this priority. I now turn it over to Mrs. Milbury. Okay, so our top, our first action strategy is the same, um, so I won't review that again, but going along with the restorative circles training and practice, the staff at the middle school will be reading the book Hacking School Discipline, and we'll participate in professional learning for the purpose of making revisions to the school's disciplinary code, um, recognizing that the restorative justice model is important and trying to get away from just punitive and get to a place where we're working with students to help them learn from mistakes, learn the why, work with each other through those circles. Um, so that book ties really nicely in with that restorative circles work. We are also going to continue with our, our wellness committee did a really nice job and this was one of our actions last year with um, some staff wellness activities. We'll continue with that by promoting physical, emotional well-being of staff, but also students and developing a series of wellness activities. So they're going to continue to develop more activities for staff. Again, they did a fantastic job last year and have some more things planned, but also adding some wellness activities for students and not just staff planning those, but some of our student groups planning some wellness activities for students. I think I stay for four. Um. So increasing community, oh sorry, this priority is improved communication for staff and community stakeholders. And the first action is increased community access engagement in the Hampstead schools through the series of district-wide engagement events. Um, we will be working hard to, you know, each year we've kind of been working to get back to years ago, but really wanting to work hard to bring the community into the school. So having some community events, we're aiming for at least four new community engaging events. I actually have a new staff member that has already come to me with multiple ideas. What if we did this? What if we did this? So it's really exciting. So we'll be working district wide to bring the community into the schools and have them join us on some awesome events. And then, um, further develop school community relationships through increasing our volunteer opportunities. We had some more volunteer opportunities last year, but we recognize at the middle school there's definitely room for more opportunities for people to volunteer in our schools. So we'll be working with the volunteer coordinator to try to increase the number of volunteers we have this year. And I'm gonna let Mr. Dion speak to the third one. The Hampstead Technology Department's action strategy is going to not just be for Hampstead Middle School, but for the whole district. Um, we will be working at the Central School, the Middle School, and the SAU office. We will be addressing cybersecurity recommendations to ensure the safety and integrity of the Hampstead School District's digital infrastructure and data. Um, some of the resources that we'll need, we're going to need some additional hardware and software resources and also the development of procedures and protocols. This work will be ongoing and the progress indicators would be implementation of recommended security measures and protocols. Thank you. Um, in, in tandem with the middle school, we're going to also work together to increase community engagement events throughout the district. Um, as Mrs. Uh, Milbury mentioned, I also have somebody that's excited to start with um, some evening performances and engagement events for the community and to help educate our families. So more information to come on that. And the one that's a little bit different here for HCS for Priority 4 
is looking at redesigning the Lunch Buddies program. For folks that aren't aware of our Lunch Buddies program, this is an opportunity to come and have lunch with your student. It will look significantly different than it has in the past, but more information to come. And we're looking to host a minimum of four events of that throughout the school year. So stay tuned for more information. And then priority five is about discerning, designing learning environments to match our educational philosophies. Something that we're really excited and passionate about at our school is developing additional programming to provide students greater access to STEAM activities, to science, technology, engineering, arts, and math activities. Um, and so we're looking to have each grade level participate in at least one new STEAM activity throughout the school year. We are also excited to celebrate with the town of Hampstead as the town turns 275. I know that we have some grade levels that are especially excited about this, but we're looking to have participation by all of our students, grades pre-K through four in my building, but eight across the district, to participate in some way, shape, or form this year. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Mackey to speak to the improvement plan. So the facilities action strategy is a five-year capital improvement plan. Uh, most of this plan is almost done at this point. Uh, I'm buttoning up a few things with uh, Mr. Dowd and Mr. Thompson. This is going to be a plan that is included anything that's 10, 000, roughly $10,000 or more, any improvement or upgrade that's going to work towards making this place better. Uh, and currently, it's a probably about 80% done. I'm just trying to button up those couple of things. It's all up here and uh, should be done by November. So you'll have that in front of you, hopefully in one of those in, in one of the school board meetings then. So. so I'll speak to the two things on here that aren't the same. Um, Promote outdoor experiential learning opportunities through the participation of grade seven and interest classrooms. So we've already spoken about that, um, but we're ex just excited to add another event of outdoor learning experience and we'll continue to work on that as well. And also enhance student learning through increased participation with Pinkerton CTE program and community partners. We um, have a, a nice group of staff who are just really committed to exposing our students to things like CTE and what they have to look forward to when they go to high school and having other community partners come in and talk about what they do, whether it be a trade that they do or just other career exploration opportunities. So we've been having a lot of conversations about how we can work five through eight and have a different kind of experience each year that the students can look forward to that they can really start to explore life after middle school but also even life after high school and what are some things that, you know, we certainly see some kids kind of start to wonder, why do I have to come to school? And we really want to keep them excited. So um, these are some great opportunities. And like I said, I have some staff really excited about exposing students to these opportunities. So we're really excited about that. So this um, next slide here, is the timeline of some of our strategic plan deliverables. And I wanted to draw your attention to last year, we had a lot of deliverables that were kind of due at the end of the year. This year, what we would like to do is offer, a, do it a little differently. We want to kind of report back to the board throughout the year on some of the things that we're able to get done earlier. Um, we'll still do an end of the year report out with a lot of pictures of children doing amazing things. Um, but there still will be an end of the year report out, but we wanted to kind of update you as the year unfolds. So at the beginning, September, October, you can see we're here establishing our teams and timelines, creating the actual action items. Early on um, in the November timeframe, you'll see that capital improvement plan, the nature's classroom field trip for seventh grade, and we already have our uh, final cohort scheduled for restorative circles training, and then the next phase of that will be implementation in classrooms. By mid-January, we will have our evaluation model written and the pilot underway. We'll be getting feedback from teachers. Morning meetings will be happening. Um, in March, April, we'll have our curriculum reviews complete in math, science, and ventures. We'll also be working to refine some of the implementation 
uh, pieces for MTSS A and also MTSS B, those processes will inevitably take time for our staff to be trained and then try the things and we'll be refining them mid-spring. Um, the, the book study will be wrapping up in April and then at the end of the year, we, we're, we're very hopeful and spring is, tends to be a little bit heavier with field trips and by then all students will have been to um, Pinkerton for CTE activities and some other uh, experiences. So that's not every deliverable, but that's kind of a general sense. All right, so uh, this is the 2023-2024 deliverables. Again, it's an aspiration on our part to continue the work um, that we've identified in the strategic plan. It's a continuation of work that we did last year. Um, some uh, new ideas and new thinking. And uh, we're excited uh, to get to work on it. I look at that list and I, I actually, it's, uh, I'm t I, I get a little exhausted just looking at the list of things that we're gonna do this year. There's a lot of really uh, great work that lies ahead. I'm excited um, to engage in that work with our team and with our, with our staff members. Um, at this time, I'll entertain, entertain any questions that the board might have specific to any uh, deliverable, any timeline. Um, any questions? I have a bunch. Yeah, I have a few, so go ahead. Let's start going around, Robin. Here, um, I love the process. I love that you have deliverables. I think this is incredibly ambitious, and if you do half of it or you iterate and change over time. That's great, like anything. Um, I do, like, part, I was part of the process in the strategic plan. I just, I want you to be, I really want you to be mindful as you try new things to try to take other things off people's plates that are concluded or you find that you don't need. Um, I love instructional rounds. I think teachers. Carl, can teachers, I just interrupt yeah. you for one second? Because yeah. I want to give you a great example of what you just said. Yeah. Because. We, that statement about adding new things, taking things off the plate. Yeah. In public education, we tend to add things to the plate and not take things off. Yeah. The, the teacher evaluation model is a wonderful example of how we are going to take things off of the plates of our teachers and our administrators. So right now we estimate that a teacher evaluation under our current model, known as the Danielson model, takes five hours to do, five hours. There are lots of forms involved, lots of meetings involved. The new model that we're proposing, which is really a walk-through coaching model, will take about 20 minutes total. So again, I, I think it was Jess that said, like, let's walk the walk, talk the talk. I, I, I could not agree more. And, and there are other pieces in here that speak to that as well, because I know that we have people at home who are looking at this, and it, it can produce some anxiety, but wow, that's a lot of things we're gonna do this year. And also just speaks to priority two, which is sort of reevaluating. What are the things that we're doing? Are they working? If they're not do if they're not working, let's stop doing them and let's start doing that makes sense. Things that make sense. So that's awesome. And I love that you're doing the instructional rounds too, where teachers learning from teachers, which is great. Um, I thought it was really cool. Um, student reflections, monthly meetings, and then ELOs, like the extended learning opportunities, or I forget how you phrase it, but um, are you going to have the kids bring back like what they learned from the extended learning opportunities and present them in the Monday morning meetings or the morning meetings? And I would, I guess, what I'd say to that is, right now these are concepts. These are okay. things that we've agreed to do. What they look like um, really can morph and change over time. Like last year, um, you know, creating these experiences. Um, you know, to send the third graders to Pinkerton for, for maple sugar. It, it was such a wonderful activity. It was really kind of basic um, in terms of um, the activity itself, but there was a lot of really great new <coughs> learning and science that went on, but the planning of that was pretty daunting. Yeah. Um, so, you know, where we'll go with some of this work? Uh, right now, I can't tell you, but I think Nicole made a good point. Like, you're, you will hear from us much sooner on progress of the strategic plan. Like. We went to task last year. We um, worked on these items and we came back to the board in June. That, that's not the goal this year. This year is, uh, we'll come back in October and I can tell you like this is, these are the pieces that we're working on and this is what some of those, that, um, ex those extended learning opportunities look like. 
and so like with the student reflections, if students are pa passionate about, they want to go and do something, and parents want to volunteer and get involved, like that's open to possibilities. Absolutely. Okay. And then you, you said that the volunteer, you want the volunteers to increase. Have we been able to increase the amount of volunteers we've gotten in the school over the past year? Uh, quite frankly, not as uh, much as we all would like. What is really um, impressive about this school district, and we've said it before, is like the amount of caring individuals and people that are willing to roll up their sleeves and support the schools. We have, and I, I'm, this isn't exact data, but it's pretty close. We have probably close to 250 vetted volunteers um, in a school district of around 850 kids. Just think about that. You know, like uh, approximately one in four parents are vetted. Um, we. We did an okay job of getting those volunteers into the building, but we didn't do a great job. And so this year, our hope is to um, expand that. Um, not just here, but in most districts, elementary schools uh, pre present lots of opportunities for volunteering, less so in middle school. We'd like to change that. Bringing back lunch buddies, we may be able to look at a new structure where not only is it an opportunity to eat with your child, but maybe it's an opportunity to give back and volunteer uh, in the schools. Good, an good answers, great process. This is incredibly impressive, and you all should be really proud. So thank you. Any other questions? No, uh, thrilled to hear that the Lunch Buddy program is coming back. Um, really interested to hear the progress around uh, the restorative circles, and uh, I, I had the, the opportunity to read Hacking School Discipline, so great book really support the process and again just look forward to hearing updates on how that's going throughout the year. Excellent. Um, my question is around uh, the data. So about something you want to do to get number two and then you can find it to get number two also. Can you talk about assessing the data? What data are we assessing on the uh, David, without having it right in front of me, can you tell me what specific Yep, so this is the priority. I'll answer on behalf of Bob and Jess, feel free to come up. Um, this is around our implementation and design of MTSS. So MTSS, and we might have spoken a little too quickly, it stands for multi-tiered systems of support. The idea is that every single child in the building is looked at critically every six to eight weeks in terms of how are they doing? How are they doing academically and how are they doing behaviorally? we do this, we'll have anecdotal teacher information and specialist information, but then we will also have formal data from our begin of the, beginning of the year diagnostic screeners. We will have ongoing formative data from classrooms, and then we'll also have end of the year summative information from SAS. So part of this is about establishing a data culture um, that trains our staff to look a little bit more closely at trends of data, not just in their classrooms, but across the grade level. So looking at student performance across the grade level to identify areas where we need to shift and change our instruction, and maybe during our win block, offer specialized pockets of instruction. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question, but it's really around establishing a solid data culture, but then also utilizing that data to drive forward evidence-based practices. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next question might be for Mrs. Mulberry. I think she was on one that was mentioning it about um, bringing people in from the trades or from outdoor. What does that look like? When do we, would we expect that? I mean, it's a great program. It's something we've talked about in the past. So we would love to hear more about what that means, just, you know, what you're thinking. Um, right, and to Mr. Thompson's point before, these are concepts, right? So it's not all planned out. Yep. We did have um, and a little bit of an experience last year with a, just a few students that got to work with um, some people about um, photography, right? So bringing 
and um, they get to learn about what they do. And we actually have a, a student that already come to me this year, a student who is really interested in videography and he makes his own movies. And we're you know, talking about how can we hook him up with a local cable television to do some work together. So things like that. Um, there is a program that my school counselor came to me about today, and I don't want to give too much away because none of my staff really know, but just where they, where, you know, it's kind of a mobile introduction to CTE where they kind of, it's like a pop-up here are some different jobs and careers and trades that you can learn about when kids get to do some hands-on learning. So those are the beginnings of it, getting students to Pinkerton to see the CTE program so that um, they know what to expect when they get there. So it's just little things like that, not a lot of solid plans yet, a lot of ideas that we want to be able to move on pretty quickly because if you wait too long, then the end of the year comes. So committed right. to doing some, some real things this year. We've talked about doing a career fair. You know, our, our counselors are really invested in, let's try to do a career fair at some point. I don't know that we'll be able to do that this year, but hopefully we will. So things like that, those are all kind okay. of the ideas that have been swirling around. Yeah, I know there's a lot of uh, community members that would love to participate in that from different trades, different career paths, et cetera. So be great to be, come back here and uh, give more information about how they can you know, participate. I, I absolutely know we can do it. I don't want to set people up too right. soon, but we will be, we'll give you updates and, and I would prefer to bring my staff here to talk to you about it. So we'll awesome. plan to do that in future Thank months. You. Thank you. I might have another one. One second. Anyway. Yeah, the last one I'll ask for tonight at least. Um, the outdoor experiential learning can you talk more about anything that you're expanding on this year, just to give a little taste? I know it's all con conceptual, but anything else for the community to be thinking about that their students will be uh, participating in? Yeah, I mean, I, I can talk a little bit, um, but I will also um, defer to Mrs. Tomaselli. Um, right now, the really solid partnership that we have is with the St. Anne's Food Pantry, uh, some of the work that we've done in the community garden, uh, but more specifically around the food pantry and. Um, you know, getting kids um, over there. I mean, they're, they're literally right next door. So that was a strong partnership that was developed this year. So th this year is really about like, okay, where are those other partnerships? Um, exploring those opportunities. Obviously, Nature's Classroom is, is a big one. We've had conversations as a team with the 275th anniversary. You know, we'd love um, to get kids over to the Historical S Society. It's something that we've aspired to do, but um, has, has been a challenge. And I, I don't know if you want to add anything to that experience. Um, so naturally, this is a lot easier to pull off during the summer. And we're right. able to utilize grant funds, bring groups in. One of the groups we brought in this summer was the UNH Brown Center. They uh, do remarkable team building, capacity building, tenacity building activities, with particularly with middle school students. And they have a really amazing facility in Durham that you know, we are hoping to take advantage of this year with some students. Um, so that's a lot of pot potential in that area. Nature's Classroom is, I believe this is gonna be kind of a springboard for us in terms of seeing what it feels like to take entire grade levels out and do something outdoors for multiple days in a row. Our science teachers did participate this summer in some professional learning at a similar facility. Um, so it's gonna be really interesting when we do our science curriculum review to see what ideas they have for hands-on field trips. Um, that's absolutely the direction we wanna go in with science instruction is hands-on, outdoor, inquiry-based learning and phenomena studies rather than textbook, worksheet. That, those, that is not gonna be what our science curriculum looks like this time next year. Okay, thank you. So it's great to hear, and I just say the last thing, um, oh, what was it? It was on, um, just a kudos to Ms. Milbury, you already mentioned it, about having st students lead different activities. I know last year I heard a lot of great things from parents and students, that allowing students to organize, you know, whether it's an assembly or an outdoor activity, whatever that is, uh, so I think that's boding really well for students and the parents are enjoying hearing how captive the students are in there. So I'm glad to hear that's continuing. Uh, I'm not sure if that's gonna move down to central school or not. I know it's a little bit more challenging to have a first grader lead an assembly, but you know, having that also- Challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I, I do wanna add, like I am gonna brag a little bit. Like I know that people are talking about backpacks, but I have to tell you, the work that Mrs. Milbury and Mrs. Joseph are doing when it comes to student voice, I, I think is very noteworthy. And what shouldn't be lost is 
you know, I was in Mrs. Mayu's uh, advisory the other day, and we had such a robust conversation around backpacks and to see students advocating. You know, like you, you think like sitting within the walls of our classrooms are future lawyers and engineers and, and doctors and um, let's put them to work now, right? Let's, let's build capacity for this future generation of leaders. I, I see it. And I think we're actually created the structure, the new schedule at the middle school actually has more dedicated advisory time for the development of what you know technically we call sort of soft skills and even with a morning meeting model at the elementary school is dedicated time to be able to develop that that student voice it, it's a, it is an important value for us anyone else all right thank you president all right thank you all right. So next we're going to turn over Mr. Dowd about the transportation update. Thank you. So I'd like to express my sincere gratitude for the patience that all of our district families have had as we've gotten our transportation off and running here for the start of the school year. It has not been as smooth, certainly, as I would like it to be. I don't think it's as smooth as a superintendent would like it to be. Um, the service level that we're receiving from our regular transportation provider has fallen far below uh, our expectations and therefore I can anticipate that it's fallen below the expectations of our parents. And I know that we've had some delays and, and some inconsistencies in pickup times and that sort of thing. And we've worked a lot of those out and for that I'm grateful for our parents and families' uh, uh, patience. So where we're at now, and I'm just going to talk about regular transportation first is that we are at a point in the year that we're able to um, get some consistent bus ridership levels and times and um, we have uh, nine buses contracted for the district we have eight at pinkerton eight at middle school and nine at at central school and it's not exactly doesn't exactly we don't have an extra bus hanging around but we are uh, scheduling eight buses for central school what that means is that your students, we, we previously scheduled nine buses and had always been running on backup. And so that meant that if you were on one of the three buses impacted by backup, you couldn't check first view and get an accurate time. We're going to be scheduling eight buses for central school, which means that the parents will be able to have times that are much closer to the actual drop off times. So that's very helpful. That was one good thing that did happen this year. Uh, we do monitor those route times, ridership. We adjust and rationalize. So if we find that we have a bus that's running extremely late, we can see what we can do to offload and adjust um, student rides and try and harmonize everything so that we can have everything run a little bit more timely. If there are any changes to routing, typically it's done before a holiday weekend with notification to the parents. Um, we, last year we did end up shifting some smaller um, riders from one bus to another and they were just notified by the bus company when that happened. So uh, I think that we've had some, some good things. One of them, again, is that if we're going to have eight buses, we're not going to have bus backup at HCS. We've been able to um, calm, I think, some of the um, uncertainty in the process. But certainly, I will uh, freely put out there that our, our current vendor has, has not met our service level expectations. The superintendent and I have personally addressed that with the bus company in person, which is less than helpful for them and for us because we have uh, things we'd like to be doing in district. So the good news is that our uh, special transportation, which had been very problematic for a number of years, is now really running very smoothly. Part of this is because our um, special transportation provider, Dorm, had also provided service to a larger district to remain nameless that surrounds us. and they that district went with first student for their special transportation and their regular transportation needs um, I'm very pleased to report that it appears Durham has a renewed focus on Hampstead which makes me feel very good so, and I think that it's very informative to administration the board um, as we are going for a bus request for proposal this year um, whether we are able to look at perhaps um, providing both contracts to one vendor and I think the service level and performance up to, to date has been very informative as to the practical reality of that. You can read between the lines. Um, it seems like it 
Durham is doing very well and maybe they should stay separate. But we'll put them out and see what happens. I expect we're going to need budget numbers, so I expect that we're going to have the RFP for transportation out around October 1st. We should hear back November 1st. That'll fit nicely into our budget time frame. Um, we'll have a robust discussion, I think, between administration. We'll probably come back to the board and, and let you know where we're at on that prior to making any sort of um, decision. But any feedback that the board has, I'd be happy to entertain um, any thoughts, questions. David um, has some. He's feeling about as good about it as I am. Yeah. I, for me, seeing what happened on the first day for the money we spent on transportation, mm -hmm. very unsatisfactory. Mm -hmm. Say that out loud. That hearing students, kindergartens, first graders being on a bus an extra 30 to 45 minutes. So they're on a bus an hour or more when they should have been on the bus 30 minutes. You know, I don't, even being on the first day, I understand a five minute, 10 minute, 15 minute, but a 30, 45 minute, you know, um, definitely, you know, I'd say Mr. Thompson and I had some good colorful discussions. Um, I was, you know, pleased to hear that Mr. Thompson went directly knocking on the door at the bus station with you, uh, Mr. Dowd, but, um, you know, Mr. Thompson, it's not the first. It's not the first year that this has happened, and I, you know, question what the training practices are leading up to the first day, because it's not like they just show up on that first day and say, "Okay, what's my bus my bus route?" Right. So, um, not very pleased at all for how that first week went. And I know a lot of parents have communicated to yourselves, to me, to other board members about this. Yeah, Mr. Thompson accompanied me on what was my third, but not final trip to the yard uh, in Plastow uh, that time. So we did go together, and that wasn't my first trip down there. I've been there so much that um, drivers are inquiring, asking who I am. So I think it's very telling, and it's very uh, informative, I think, for us as an as a administration and as a board, um, what level of performance we can expect um, as these RFPs go out and vendors start responding. Yeah, and I'm enthused that there is another bus company around that we can evaluate. I think this is a weighing factor we should think about strongly. Absolutely. Yeah. So, anything else, board members? Yeah. Okay. So, and then just to let the board know as well, some of the um, practices that we're going to be looking at with whoever we're using for a vendor next year is to make sure that we can reconcile our student lists with the routing and uh, and scheduling of students for completeness. We don't have the option to do that really for Pinkerton, but we do have the opportunity to do it locally, and I think that's something that we've picked up out of this cycle is that that is something that, that we cannot rely on oh it's all set yeah i think that when we're evaluating having a under, better understanding of readiness what that means and evaluating that that's something that has to be in place yeah because they definitely weren't ready this year we had the same issue last year i'm going to venture to guess a few years in the past so just i i will agree with you i think that it's slightly less settling because what happened last year ran up to the wire what happened this year, I was assured a week right. and a half before school started that it was all set. And I went and ran some tests and, and validated some data. But in fact, it was far, far from, from where it should have been at that point. It was far from where it should have been when school started. Right. Those are questions we asked in the summer. We said we were told, yep, everything's And it fell flat. So. Yep. And I go in and I test um, a variety of ways, like an edge log and that sort of thing, new students, returning students, students going from central to middle, high school and all that. So there are a number of samples that I can pull to, to test. And it seemed like everything I was pulling was, was fine. And it all certainly gets sorted out that first day of school. So, but we need a more robust, I think, data comparison between the two, between us and our vendor, which we'll be doing going forward. Okay. Yeah. I think uh, Mr. Dowd articulated it well. I just want to add one other piece that um, it's frustrating uh, because we haven't been able to come up with a solution. And as educators, we see ourselves as like problem solvers, right? Um, and I think the thing that uh, I had a really uh, good conversation with a parent, actually a few parents. I, one of the issues I think that bothers me the most is um, the bus backup. Um, is the, the decisions for that are made like on efficiency and trying to get kids home as quickly as possible when we have less buses. But I think part of the issue, there's an equity issue. It, it appears that it, 
it, it's oftentimes the same families that end up on bus backup. So, you know, that's something that we need to look at as well, is that we, we have a group of parents who are continually impacted by bus backup, and then there are other families that are not at all. And sometimes that's a matter of efficiency, but that's an issue that we really need to dig into and address. It's just, it's just not fair. We essentially we take three buses, eliminate one, and split the balance of the two between the remaining buses. And that is how we get to eight buses for Central School. So as we are going through the process of getting actual ridership and times, we can then go in and better rationalize those, those routes. So we can get set up so that if they are on bus backup and that's become more permanent, that we can shift things around to make, um, make it more consistent. So. OK. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is the uh, state adequacy aid encum encumbrances. Mr. Dowd. Yes. So those are on the agenda as one line item. There are actually two. It probably should be and encumbrances. Let's talk about adequacy aid first. So every year for the past several years, um, I've come to the board to let you know that we, we budgeted an amount as part of our original budget for adequacy aid and our adequacy aid is higher than what we had budgeted. And for the past several years, we've, we've let it lapse to offset taxes. This year, because of some statutory changes that were made, uh, we have an opportunity. We've actually received um, about $273,888 um, in additional adequacy aid um, as a result of this statutory adjustment, this, this formula adjustment that the legislature made in their last session. So let me just take a step back and tell you that our original budget was 2.42 million. Our actual is going to be about 2.8 million. So that's a difference of 435,672. Of that 435,000, some of that is due to changes that we've had in ADM, um, identification perhaps of free or reduced students. There's a number of factors. But the bottom line is 273,000 of that is attributable solely to statutory changes, and 161,000 of that is due to simply our changes. So this year, I would like the board to consider whether it makes sense to take that $273,888 and uh, consider holding a public hearing and a special meeting of the voters, a voting session, to uh, increase our appropriations to include that as a contribution to capital reserve. We are still returning 161,784 above budgeted uh, revenue to, to offset taxes. And so this 273, uh, 273,888 uh, would be added to our budget and it would be made as a contribution to our capital reserve fund to build that up. So if I can break down layman's terms, Mr. Dowd, every year the state returns money to us the last few years. Mm -hmm because they essentially say, well, we're giving you more money back Correct. than what they had estimated. Correct. So it's almost like sandbagging. They say it, we're only going to get so much, but then they say, oh, here's a few more dollars. I didn't want to say it. Yep. But that's what, All right. that's what it is. And so this year, you know, last year there was, a, I, I want to say it was over half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. This year it's just under half a million. Um, of the 435,000, you're saying 161,000. Um, we couldn't put towards our capital reserve if we wanted to because of you know regulations. Let's say, correct? Correct. We, there's so what we could it would be two hundred seventy-three thousand if we, if the board so desired to go into capital reserve. Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. Yeah. I think everybody knows where most of us stand on this. That you know, with a moving project trying to build the classrooms because we are at capacity. Um, I know I'm, I would strongly advocate that we do look at holding that 273,000 into capital reserve because essentially that's, it's, um, as you said, over budget being returned to us. I would advocate that we do this to raise the capital reserve so that we less, we'd have to go uh, to, this tax, to the tax uh, payers, less money to, for them to fund the, uh, any addition that we choose for next year. You know, we have somewhere around 
four and a half million dollars to find money. We've got some, you know, we've got a good amount um, put in capital reserve. This would definitely support and help a bit more. So, I don't know, other board members, your thoughts? Um, so in order to do this, if we were to do this, uh, we would have to post for a public hearing and a special meeting um, in order to properly educate the, the community, get their input, and then eventually vote to uh, move this money into capital reserve. So um, I don't know if any questions on that from anyone. Make sense? All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make the motion then. Um, I'd like to motion to hold a public hearing on September um, 21st, Thursday, uh, with a special meeting to be held on October 10th, 2023, to appropriate additional funds furnished by the state of New Hampshire pursuant to RSA 197.3a. Um, yeah, that's my motion on that. Second. Any discussion? Um, Melissa, do you have to take a roll call for that? Or no? Okay. Yeah, any discussion? And we're good. All right. And all approved? All right. All right. And then. Um, in order to do this also, we would have to have a uh, special warrant article. So I'd like to make the motion to move forward the following uh, for a special warrant article. Article one, shall the voters of Hampstead School District vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $273,888 to be placed in the school renovation reconstruction uh, and capital improvement capital reserve uh, established in 2006 said some representing the additional adequacy funds supplied to the district by the state legislature for the 2023-2024 fiscal year which were not made known to the district until after the 2023 district annual meeting subject to uh, changes languages and language changes uh, requested by the Department of Revenue Administration and or the Department of Education. I'll second that as well. Any discussion? All right. And all approved? All right. So, Mr. Yada, I'm assuming that this will be posted pretty soon. To be tomorrow. tomorrow. It will be posted tomorrow. tomorrow to the public? Okay. We would need that to have our public hearing dates line up. Uh, I've checked with the district moderator and or our school district moderator and he's available on the 10th. I still need to check in. I've, I've sent a message to the supervisor of the checklist, but I have not heard back. So I'm thinking that one way or the other we can accommodate that. Right. And if we have to change it, we have the next school board meeting that we could change as needed. Correct. Right. Okay. But bear in mind that we don't want this to get in the way of tax rate setting. Correct. In October 10th is probably about the latest that we can go yep. without interrupting that process. So. Yep, got it. All right. Thank you. All right. Speaking of, go right into the uh, HCS edition plan design discussion. With Mr. Thompson. Okay, so. Uh, with the uh, Central School Edition uh, plan, we continue to make progress. We actually held a meeting this week uh, with Trident, which is the uh, project manager um, for the renovation. Uh, unfortunately, I was not able to attend that meeting, but Mr. Dow did, and I'll have him give just a very brief update on the progress that we continue to make. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. So we did meet with the um, our project manager and it looks like we will have some um, targets for so we get some pricing estimates and so taking those pricing estimates was enough for the board to look at and say look we like the plan with the four in the back and the two coat classrooms uh, now we're asking them to put pen to paper and come back with some actual um, I'll say real pricing but some more detailed pricing and we expect that to be in I believe uh, mid to end of October if I'm not mistaken and from there the board or committee the building committee can take a look and see if there are any opportunities or areas that we'd like to address as part of that pricing scheme 
and we'll, we'll then turn that back to our project manager who will then go back to the architect and construction company and um, incorporate our requested changes to give us some final pricing, which should be early December, I would say. But I think we're in pretty good shape with that. I think we're far ahead of where we've been hit almost any year in the past. So. Yeah, the, in a good discussion, the thing we'd add, I'd add is we'll also look at risk opportunities as we've done in the past to look at where could we look at cost takeouts, take a little bit of risk there if we want to cut some of the, the things that they put in there for just in case uh, so that it's going to happen in November as well. And that's why that will lead us to beginning of December, end of November, some, you know, what we would move forward with, with it, however we decide to the voters. So that was the plan there. What we also asked is for um, Trident to also reach out to BPS and talk about anything that if we were to look about um, the schedules to understand when we would be able to take occupancy of the, of the uh, six classrooms. They did assure us that if we move forward for the six classrooms that we would have occupancy by the beginning of 2025 school year. So that would happen. Uh, you know, we've also asked, well, what's the potential sooner than that? if we wanted for whatever reason, but also if there's anything that we could look at funding or starting sooner uh, that will help the schedule as well. So all that will be uh, provided by BPS and Trident um, later this year or beginning of next year for the, for the part about what could we you know, fund earlier to get things going faster. We have a, a longer lead time, so the earlier we can get them on it, the earlier they can begin securing materials. Good discussions. Looking forward to next month. Uh, we just got to get that on the books. And for the, we did uh, uh, request that um, the discussion about uh, looking at the more detailed price to first go through the building committee. So, any questions for me or Mr. Allen? All right. Uh, next one, uh, school board members for the. Um, last part of our agenda before we turn over board comments is the school board goals discussion. As we typically do at this meeting, we look over what the school board goals are and then we would, over the next couple of weeks, think about on our own, t talk to one another about if there's anything that we may or may not want to continue with, add, edit, etc. So tonight, uh, we're just going to go through them. Uh, I'd say quickly, but just a, a little detail uh, for ourselves as well as anybody at home and in the public. Uh, but with the goal that the next meeting we will uh, come and have a discussion around adding, editing, removing. All right. Uh, so without further ado, uh, we do have uh, seven goals for ourselves as board members, as a board. What we want, um, facility improvements. We've talked about this. This is not not only the central school, but also partnering with uh, Mr. Thompson and Mr. Mackey about what that capital improvement plan is for the school so they're keeping up to date on maintenance and we don't have a big um, issues later on that we avoided maintenance and or improvements that are needed. Uh, so ultimately reducing cost of what it takes to keep the schools up to date. Appreciation of diversity and inclusivity. Um, as we've talked about supporting culture of acceptance, diversity, equal and inclusivity by providing opportunities for professional development to the staff that foster a uh, variety of perspectives to ensure our schools are welcoming, respectful, and safe learning environment. Um, this one here was a really interesting one, just as a note for anyone in public. We had someone ask us, well, what does this mean? And I thought Mr. Thompson did a really great job of, um, responding that, as an example, when students want to stay after school for help or to be um, uh, at, at games, but maybe their parents are working and they don't have a ride home, well, we offer transportation. That's an, that's an example of being inclusive, being able to provide those opportunities to students to do things that maybe they're challenged to because they can't take part of something. So finding ways to make sure that everybody has an ability to take part of stuff in school. So I thought that was a really good uh, example here. Uh, strategic plan, we just talked about. So Mr. I won't go too much further than that. Really great to see, um, you know, in the last couple of years on the board, seeing that and actually put in action. It's great to see that, you know, we're putting our money where our mouth is. Um, budget. Again, this one's about uh, being very transparent. We're on budget season, so starting next month, we'll have a number of budget reviews open to the public as we do every year, so the public can hear, listen, ask, review. Everything's posted online at 100% transparency. 
uh, something that's been really great to see the last couple of years, and we'll continue that and look for feedback. Uh, effective use of financial resources with attention to grant funding. Again, find m money where there can be money so it lowers the tax threshold, but also increases um, just opportunities for our students, our teachers, our staff. And supporting district-wide implementation of innovative practices uh, and universal design for learning by staff. Again, just some of the things we talked about, Nature's Classroom, uh, the Brown Center, anything we can bring in in the summer, anything we can do during the year. So uh, those are just examples of what we've been doing in the years past. Um, and again, outdoor community-based learning, um, something one of our former board members was very passionate about, and we can, we've continued uh, focusing and supporting this. So unless any questions by board members, anything here that um, want to ask questions on, but as you can see in your packet, um, Melissa, as great as she is, has provided a blank form as well. That way, if we're, uh, you want to write down some notes and bring it to the next board meeting of anything you want to see edited, added, removed, um, say welcome the opportunity to discuss and see if there's anything we want to you know, challenge and make better for the future here. Anything else? All right. Uh, board comments and correspondence, as usual. To the left. To the left. Um, I was able to volunteer at the um, special uh, the, the um, Junior Olympics over the weekend, and um, it was really, really fun. So uh, I would like to thank Andy for his MC skills on that and all his hard work. But it was uh, it was a really great day, and the kids had a great time. It's nice to see that come back. Yep. Um, I too briefly attended and it was great to see all the kids out there and um, I'd say tremendous amount of volunteers to make that happen. Um, I was overwhelmed to see how many volunteers were there. Mr. Giard was there also, Mr. Pellegrini, um, and a lot of community members. I, I, could, I don't know if I, I could count how many, maybe as many as the students. Um, and it's great that it's back this, this, this year. I uh, really hope that it continues to grow again back to what it was. So. Um, uh, let's see what else. The, the building committee meeting was at, at that. That was great. Um, can't remember if the, uh, the first day of school or welcoming the teachers. I was here for that as well. That was really great to see. And, um, you know, just uh, the last two years seeing what Mr. Thompson talks about. For those that don't know, uh, sorry, I'm going to ruin it for those that aren't here, but he always puts a chair in the, in the, in the middle. And it's, uh, it's really great to see because he's talking about. Think about the student you wanted to have there. It's like your favorite student you ever had. You treat all your students like that. Think about the student that needs the most help. That's the student you want to be there. And talk to the teachers and the paras and the staff about it. It's really great to think about. You know, just think about who who your favorite is or who the one that needs that attention. Treat all the students that way. It was good to hear. Um, I think that's all I had. Dr. Abner. Yeah. And I uh, also had the opportunity to be at the Junior Olympics and was uh, it was amazing just seeing all the smiling faces and uh, you know just happy to be a part of it happy to you know have a hand in putting it together uh, I was also at the uh, the first day welcoming the teachers back to school and that was amazing to see as a new school board member just you know seeing all of those faces excited to be here and uh, and uh, you know I think uh, Bob's words really, it certainly pumped me up, but it, it's just awesome seeing all the staff excited. Uh, you know, I, I think your, uh, your message to them was exactly what they needed to hear at that time. So, thank you. kudos to you. All right, uh, we're gonna turn it over to the consent agenda. Personnel report with you, Mr. Thompson. All right, uh, there is not a personnel report uh, this evening. Uh, but to move into the superintendent's report, uh, the big story is just like a really amazing uh, opening day, opening days of school. Um, you know, I, I started my day here at the middle school. The middle school parents are always very excited to drop their kids off for the first day of school. Um, and the way the middle school, you know, starts the school year with everybody, the entire community uh, in the gymnasium to see the energy. Like I. 
I was standing next to staff members who, it, who were like dancing and so excited uh, to greet their students. Um, so the, the, the way in which uh, the middle school sort of executes with that sort of whole community meeting uh, to, be, to begin the school years is very impressive. And then uh, the, the day goes on and uh, heading over to the central school, uh, carpool's a little different uh, on the first day of school. There, there's a lot of crying, um, and sometimes the kids cry too. Um, <laughs> you know, we we have to sometimes separate parents from their children. Um, what a lot of parents don't see is that yes, for our you know preschool, first grade kiddos, kindergarten kids, um, there's a lot. There can be a lot of tears. What they what they don't see that I actually get to see is once they're in. It takes all of like three seconds for the smiles, the laughter, um, the singing. Um, it, like it, I really, after the first day, was I, I'm just so proud to be part of this community where our staff work so hard to make um, the school year just such a great experience for our kids and, and really do a great job on that first day of school. Um, and then I think the other big story for me is um, we, we, I think I said this before, but I'm going to say it again. Like we, we hired some really talented people. And um, it was really affirmed in the opening days, going to their classrooms and seeing um, just the work that they're doing, the value added that they'll bring to our community. There's a lot that our um, teachers can teach them, and there's a lot that our community can learn from them. Um, I, it's, it has not been all roses and rainbows and unicorns. There's definitely been some challenges. Um, we, we, had, uh, we had bees, uh, Mr. Mackey's crew took, took care of the, the bee issue that we had. Luckily, I don't think anyone was stung. We had a geese problem over at the Central School the other day. Um, we also had um, some, uh, in all joking aside, we also had some pretty significant heat. Uh, luckily, the district, we've come up with some uh, pretty decent um, solutions we're going to continue to work on. Uh, last Friday's dismissal at Central School with the inclement weather, uh, to be frank, it was pretty scary at, at one point. Um, and then I think the, the biggest challenge and the one that I, I really need to impart into the community is staffing of our paraeducators. Um, the support, and I'm not going to steal all of the thunder because I, I, I'm going to ask our Director of Student Services to talk a little bit about this, but um, we have significant staffing needs for paraeducators. And I, and I will go as far to say that it, it does have an impact on our instructional program. Um, so if there are people out there, even substitutes, we can have substitute teachers fill in for support staff and paraeducators. So maybe you're not ready to commit to becoming a full-time or part-time staff member. There's still plenty of opportunities uh, for you to be able to um, even substitute teach. But if you're thinking about working in education, please reach out to the building principals, our director of student services, myself, can apply online. Let's just have the conversation. I appreciate, I sent out a communication the other day, I had a couple of parents reach out to me just to have the conversation about whether or not this might be uh, a move they'd, li they'd like to make. It's a very rewarding career. Um, so yeah, opening day went uh, quite well. Um, with that said, I'm gonna turn it over I think, to Jeff first, who's gonna provide a couple of updates as well. For proceeding, I do have a quick question uh, for the board. So um, I would presume a public hearing time of 7 p.m.? Okay. And then the special meeting is going to be on October 10th, which I believe is a regularly scheduled meeting night conveniently. So what time would the special meeting be? Would it be at 7 and then our regular meeting would be after that at 7.30? Uh, board members, what do you want to do? Do you want to do a 6 or do you want to do 7 for... It doesn't? Tuesday, okay. Okay. <laughs> I know you got like six different things you're volunteering for and yeah, no. Uh, so, all right, let's do a 6 p.m. for that meeting. Special meeting, it shouldn't take that long. Do you want to try for 6.30? 6.30, okay. Yeah, 6.30. And, and then our regular meeting, scheduled meeting time at seven will be in place. Right. Um, thank you. No, thank you. We spoke a little bit about um, air conditioning and the heat. Um, we've been able to really cover a lot of uh, central schools, so just by way of a quick update, we were able to um, install dehumidification as part of the 60s wing renovation. We had some leftover portable units that we were able to install on the south side <coughs> of all the classrooms in that building. 
uh, summer before last, and this past summer we were able to install portable units on the north side. So overall, the um, condition for a building that's mostly not air conditioned in Central School is not terrible. It seems very bearable. We're losing education days when we have extreme heat. This building has extreme heat. We're in one of the um, three areas that's um, air conditioned here with the gym, the CAF, and, and the administrative <coughs> office area. Thank you, Joe. And so we were able to actually bring in some portable units here as well, I think about five or so, um, into some of the warmer classrooms and the more needed classrooms. And you'll see as part of the budget process that we're going to continue that implementation probably through um, split units, split head units. So be on the lookout. There is some light at the end of the tunnel, and I'm really happy with the progress we've made. It's no consolation to the folks who and the students who have been in those, those hot classrooms. But it is what it is, and we're, uh, we're getting there. Sure. So, is it very nice? Oil, oh, yes, that's right. Thank you. Last night, I was at the Selectman's meeting, a uh, rather humorous interchange with Mr. Weimer. You can appreciate his sense of humor, would have appreciated what he, uh, what he did there. But we um, coupled our oil and fuel needs with the town again, and we received, I think, a very favorable rate of two ninety nine a gallon for oil. Um, and I think we're a little less on propane. And just bear in mind that we have always sent out an oil bid, but we've never... Uh, had enough propane to send out. And so when we're able to couple with the town, we're able to leverage their propane with our propane and they're able to leverage our fuel with their fuel and everyone seems to work and make, make it a little bit better. So we went with Palmer, they were the only um, uh, viable bidder, let's just say. We had another bid, but it wasn't quite a bid. So and that was it, so it was a success and thank you. There's a lot of encouragement here, a lot of uh, work with the town to get that done and I'm very happy that that's something we just do every year. So. Excellent. Yeah. And at this time, I'm going to ask our Director of Student Services, Jessica Parsons, to give us an update on student services. Good evening again. Um, student services uh, was off to a great but busy start um, at the beginning of this school year. And ultimately, um, our year doesn't really end. It continues on during the summer um, through the, the programs we offer for students um, in our ESY, but also um, in the fact that um, stu students and families are, move in fluidly throughout the school year, right? They don't just move in at the start of the school year, they move in, um, they could move in throughout the summer. And so that, when we budget in October for the needs that we know, we can't always anticipate what will happen throughout the school year. Um, and so we've had quite a few move-ins over the summer, which is great. Um, we love families moving into Hampstead. We love being able to provide and support for those students moving in. But sometimes that impacts um, our staffing and our ability to meet the needs of all of our students. And so um, we've had a significant amount of move-ins that have required additional support that was not necessarily budgeted for. Um, in addition to that, we had a huge influx of referrals last year um, to special education, even to um, uh, Section 504. And so again, you can't anticipate what will be required for supports and services. And so that influx of referrals, as well as an increased um, uh, move in um, with needs has impacted our staffing patterns and we're working to fill those gaps internally we've looked at students that have made progress that may need to shift off some supports and utilizing those to fill the gaps but we're also recognizing that there continues to be areas of need and we're working with each of the um, building principles to fill those but I just wanted to give you guys a heads up because um, that will impact future planning for us as well as the budget um, and I'm happy to, to discuss more of those um, more of that data in detail at, m at the next board meeting where I'll be presenting a student services um, deliverable plan any questions so I know that sounds vague, but I also have to be careful in terms of confidentiality. Um, and so I'm just making sure I'm giving you enough information. If we don't have the ability to fulfill all the needs for, this is probably more your side, the, all the powers that we need, can we, do we have outside contractors that we can use? Sure, absolutely. So um, that's something that's new to us. Um, we had been doing that in the past with some of our support staff when we're working with agencies like Birch Tree that provide an RBT or a BCBA. So we've done that in the past. This year is the first year that we've contracted with agencies for specific paraprofessional support. So we are working with um, two outside agencies right now um, because one couldn't fulfill all of our needs. Um, we have two contracted paras working here at HMS. Um, we will be looking um, to fill a couple more roles using utilizing uh, the contracted services. 
But what I will say is, um, and these contractors are lovely and they're, um, they're a wonderful addition, but ultimately we'd like to fill those roles that are posted with an employee. And so those aren't taking the place of those postings. It's just basically filling the needs of our students until we're able to fill those roles permanently with, um, with our own hires. Yeah, Does that make sense? Yeah, and it's, it's, if you have a contracted para, it's not necessarily the same para. So you may have inc different paras come so there's less consistency for this. So the agencies we're currently contracting with, we are having uh, continuity in our staffing. So okay. they have um, assigned, uh, we have actually been able to, through the agencies we currently use, we interview these people first. We do. We make sure, um, we vet them through our own process, but the agencies are also vetting them as well. And so there's a double vetting process there. And then those people, um, those designated staff members that we have interviewed then become the contractor. And so they're not sending in different people every every couple of weeks. And I'm guessing that contracted powers cost more than in district powers. Can I pass that question off to you, Jeff? It's a little bit more technical than just a yes or no, I think. Surprisingly, not always. Okay. And are these, uh, are most of these pairs from the consulting agency uh, more geared towards one-to-one -one, like special education support rather than a para that bounces from classroom to classroom like a, a typical one that you'd hire probably from the job openings that we have open now yeah so the current the current um paraprofessional roles we're filling with these contractors are special ed designated paras. However, that's a range that could be, um, some of them are supporting in the classroom doing more of the academic support. Mm -hmm. Others have been um, designated to work one-to-one. -one. We look at their skill set, we look at what their experience is, we look at what their um, previous training was, and then we kind of assign them based on what their, um, uh, kind of what their level of experience is. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. And <clears throat> I'd just like to add too that, um, you know, the s partial solution to this has been the individuals that you see over there have been filling these roles. I was literally at the Central School the other day and our Director of Student Services is a one-on-one -on -one, uh, support person for a student who really needed the support. And you know, I see our building administrators and Nicole like out at recess, uh, trying to pick up the slack because like these students, they need the support. We can't not provide it. Um, and so you know, we're doing everything we can, but um, we we need help. So, and um, that's all I have for the superintendent report. I'd welcome um, any questions or comments that the board members might have about anything that was presented. Nope. Thank you. Um, under other business, old business, we do have something we did skip, so we're going to go back to it. To Mr. Dow's point earlier, it was st state adequacy aid and encumbrances. So, uh, board members, quickly, uh, in your packet, uh, there was a memorandum uh, from Mr. Dowd about the encumbrances um, from the 22-23 fiscal year, um, where we have $70,938.45 and then a, another encumbrance of $20,813. Um, if there's any questions on those from you, but I'll, uh, I'll make the motion to approve the encumbrances for the fiscal year ended t June 30th, 2023, per the CFO's mem memo dated September 12th, 2023. We got a second from Ms. Pellegrini. Any questions? All approved. All right, thank you. All right, um, we do intend to go into non-public. Uh, I do believe we'll come out of non-public um, and have it disclose what that was for. So I'll make the motion to go into non-public under RSA 91A3, 2A and C. I'm looking for a second. Thank you. All right, Melissa, can you take the roll call? Sure. Mr. Giard? Yes. Dr. Hubner? Yes. Mr. Cabarrus? Yes. Mrs. Pellegrini? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Thank you. A54. All right. On behalf of the board who has come up with this quote, which is with two plus years of outstanding results, 
We are excited to continue our investment in students' education by extending the superintendent's contract. Mr. Thompson has had a profound influence on regaining positive momentum towards student success in academic improvement and excellence, committing to positive employee relations, creating and executing long-term strategic planning goals, and he continues to exceed in community and stakeholder engagement, implementing and supporting innovative programs and initiatives, and focusing on student safety and well-being. Together, we are shaping a brighter future for our learners. We are excited about this extended commitment to Mr. Thompson and continuing to invest in the vision for our district. Um, we did agree to terms uh, that the contract would be an additional four years, running from uh, July 1st, 2024 through uh, July, June 30th, 2028. So thank you, Mr. Thompson, for the last few years, and we're looking forward to the more bright years ahead of us. Any words? Um, I just want to thank the board. Um, this, uh, Hampstead is my home. I love this place. Um, you know, I tell uh, people all the time, you know, I spend approximately two hours in the car commuting every day. Um, and I, I'm sure there would be an opportunity closer to home if I wanted it. I don't. I want to work here. Uh, and I'm willing to, to make that commitment um, because uh, how tremendous a community this is. And it's our staff, it's our students, it's our parents, but it, it is the Hampstead community that um, just, it keeps me coming back. I told Chairman Smith when he first approached me about negotiating a new contract, I said, I'll, I'll make it easy. I, I really want to come back. So, um, you know, let, let's make this work. So I appreciate um, the board's uh, commitment to my leadership. And my goal is to continue to provide results with the tremendous team that I have in place. So thank you. Thank you.